see the picture. Yeah, that's, that's something. That's a site that... You're watching Public Affairs. Berkowitz is my name, and politics is our game, and we will be doing lots of politics and public policy this evening because we have as our guest Darling Singer. Darling Singer. Singer, right. Darling Singer. She is a state rep. She knows a lot about politics. She knows a lot about public policy. But most important, we know we've been focusing on our show a bit in the last few months on pension reform, and, uh, and that's been a big issue. It presumably was a big issue at the end of May. It's a big issue now. And yet we had somebody, well, we had Dan Duffy on the show. Mm -hmm. You know Dan? He, yeah. He's a colleague of yours. He's mm -hmm. a state senator. You're a state rep. Right. You're both state legislators. You're both Republicans. You both came in in 2009? Uh, 2009. 2009. Right. Both came in at the same time. And he said, while the Senate was debating the so-called pension reform legislation, he said, and that was sponsored by President Cullerton, mm -hmm. that legislation, which actually passed the state Senate, didn't right. come before the state House, he said it was a big joke. All right? Can we get that graphic up? Duffy calls Cullerton pension legislation a big joke. Now, President Cullerton, if you're watching this, knows I'm not saying that. I'm highlighting it only because that was a point Duffy wanted to make. He made it on the show last time. Did he get it right, Darlene Singer, State Representative Darlene Singer, Republican from Naperville? Was that legislation that President Cullerton sponsored, was it a big joke? You know, it, it, no, I didn't hear a lot of laughter when they uh, finished the vote on the thing, but what the bill that passed through the Senate pertained only to the state portion of employees. It did not um, affect teachers or universities. So that's part of... That's a lot of people. So it affected only two. There are five pension yeah. funds. One is state employees, or state employees proper. Mm -hmm. Was, were those affected by this? The state employees state proper, employee. the General Assembly systems, and you know anyone else where the state is the employer okay. was affected. So. But not the state, not the public school teachers? Right, not okay. public school teachers, universities, and community colleges. Okay, which are a part. They are a part of the pension. They're half of the Except, pension. Except, well, this, we should say the downstate teachers, the suburban teachers upstate, they're a part of that, but the Chicago public school teachers are not a part of that. Right? They are not. They're, they're, they're separate, yeah. So that's a big, but that's a big part, okay? It's 50% of the problem. At least. Okay. At least, yeah. Now that was not, and that wasn't touched by that legislation, and that legislation, it had an adjustment of the cost of living index, which I'm told is an important factor, right? The right. COLA. Right. Did it have an adjustment of the retirement age? It did not have an adjustment of retirement age in there, and it did not have an incre additional employee contribution that the governor's original points had. Does, uh, no, does, was that also, I mean, I should have asked Senator Duffy was here, but in your understanding, was that another factor why he thought it was a big joke? Not only did it not cover three of the major funds, but it only had one of the three factors that Governor Quinn wanted to reform. Right. Is that you think he also meant that was a big joke for that reason? Too? And yeah, and and why you know what he was referring to as a big joke is that even though it, it came across like this is significant pension solution, it's very barely budging the unfunded liability as a whole. So the numbers weren't really thought through. It's amazing how you know they started changing things mm -hmm. without really analyzing. So it, it was like an eighty-three billion dollar underfunding. That's what we're talking about. The pensions, mm -hmm. the state employee pensions, that's what we're talking about, folks. State employee pensions, they're underfunded by $83 billion. Right. right. That means somebody, if right now, if you wanted to say, okay, these funds are being handled properly, you'd have to, you'd have to go ahead and find $83 billion and put them in now, right? Right. Just not, we're taping this show on July 7th. Anybody got $83 billion out there? Well, the, the entire revenue for the state this year was $33 billion. Okay, so, so that gives you a grasp on how big okay. this problem is. All right. And so if that legislation had passed the state house and signed by the governor, legislation that Duffy called a big joke, how much of that $83 billion deficit would you say is cured or fixed by that legislation? They're, they're estimating maybe $10 billion. Ten billion. So it still leaves you with seventy-three billion dollars in underfunding. Right. Now, to be fair, if Senate President Cullerton were here, what do you think he would say if he said Duffy says your legislation that you sponsored, President Cullerton, was a big joke? 
if if he was, I don't know what he would say. But if you he know was the here, president. He's he a serious would, guy. He's a serious. He would guy. have a response. Yeah. To, give me your best guess. And you know, he would probably come out and say that there's some parts of the bill that were good, you know, and we're moving the needle in some direction. But it's far from it's far 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 from where we need to be. And and the whole goal here is to make these pensions sustainable for the long term. And um, it does not do that. It does. And you think President Carter would, would he concede that, right? I would hope so. That's what I would hope to say. Weesh. Not to leave the false impression that this is, you know, going to keep the funds sustainable. Yeah. And, you know, you're seeing a graphic there now that talks about the pension reform state, stakeholders, legislators, state employees, government service providers, you know, people who provide human services, contract for the state. They're affected by this because they're being crowded out. And so their businesses are affected. They can't provide services that people want in the state. We got the government service recipients like Medicaid. You have people who help provide Medicaid, but then you have the Medicaid recipients. And we've got taxpayers. They're affected by right. it. We got the unions because they say these deals were struck and made and they're not being kept. So on the other hand, you know, so that's that's a, you know, it's the conventional wisdom. Those are the stakeholders. That's what people would say. Okay. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, there are 13 million people in the state of Illinois. You've got a pretty good sense of what's going on. Naperville itself is a pretty big city, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's not a small village. About 150,000. What is it? If you like, you got Chicago. You got what's? What does it rank in terms of cities? It's number five. Number in five. Size. So yeah. it's a big deal. Okay. Mm -hmm. And your district covers. A good portion of a good Naperville, portion of it, right? a good portion of Aurora. Mm -hmm. So you get her out. You get and talk to these people. Uh, but on the other hand, you know they got jobs, they got kids, they got families. The kids go to school. You know, does it really matter to them this stuff about pension reform? You know, to the great 13 million people. I know there's numbers. You know, if you're a Medicare, if you're a Medicaid recipient, it matters because you may not be. Your budget's affected by that. If you at a public school, especially if you're a public school teacher, your salary might be affected by that. But in the main, the 13 million people, are they much affected by this pension reform stuff? You know, they're, they are affected by the pension reform stuff. I don't think they really understand to the, what degree um, they're affected Well, tell me, by. convince me. Say I'm Joe Blow. I'm, jo I'm Joe Sixpack, and I'm sitting there and I'm watching a ball game, and Berkowitz comes on and says, watch my show instead. Why should he watch this show with Berkowitz with Darlene Singer instead of he could be watching the Cubs and the White Sox? And here's, here's the thing for the, every individual needs to understand about the pension problem in Illinois. Number one, it is taking away from public safety, education, Medicaid, human services, and the rest. Taking because away. the <coughs> dollars that are being allocated to those other divisions are now being shortchanged because of the pension problem. And there's, no, there's no room for growth there. The broad picture, the basic budget people talk about is the general revenue fund budget, which right. is roughly how much? $33 billion. And you voted for a resolution to cap that. Mm -hmm. Did it work? There was a resolution? Did, we kept it. And yeah. did you cap it because Governor Quinn signed legislation recently? Was it at $32.9 billion? We, we kept it at uh, the 33 billion that we kept at the and house. And is that so the legislation that he signed? Yeah, that's the okay, legislation. Okay, so you that he you signed. had an impact. Right. The power of one. Well, it You're wasn't one. just myself, but, but we, other people. Everyone there, okay. you know, we had we and the house did the tough stuff again by, you know, we we made cuts to human services and education. But going back So okay, but there's a 33 billion dollar budget and just before we get we say going back the state made a pension payment this year. They didn't always make them, but they right. made it this year. Was it about $5 billion? It was a little over $5 billion. Okay. And they also, they also made a payment for retiree health care that I think runs about a billion and a half. Yeah. So retirees, in terms of what they're consuming of that budget, $5 billion plus a billion and a half for health care, that's six and a half. And then there was bonds. There are lots right. of bonds, but bonds specifically, pensions had borrowed, and the right. state was paying back on those bonds, right. principal and interest of about a billion dollars. Right. So retiree costs, health care, pension, so forth, are accounting for about seven and a half billion dollars of a $33 billion budget. Do the quick math. You know, this isn't the SATs. You know, the kids get to use calculators. Right. But so, so kids, if you're watching out there, if our interns, some of them are kids, 
Is, this is why maybe it's not so good that you're so used to, you don't have to do math, you say, because the SATs allow you to take a calculator. But on this program, you know, I'm like, where's my calculator? I don't have it. So $32 billion, 33, eight, seven and a half, almost eight, yeah. it's being spent. Eight out of 32, what is that? That's about a quarter, almost right. 25%. I want to be precise, 22, 23% right. goes to the retirees. So before you start talking about Medicaid, right. before you start talking about helping poor people who, or low-income people, not even poor, who need health care, before you start talking about education and doing more or sustaining education or not cutting early childhood education, before you start talking about prisons and keeping people safe, I mean, like Mike Nolan says, we educate, we medicate, and we educate, medicate, and what do we call And incarcerate. Mm -hmm. Nice saying, Mike. <laughs> Senator Nolan is out here. We hope to come back. Really, it summarizes pretty well what the state of Illinois does. Mm -hmm. Medicate, incarcerate, educate. Mm -hmm. Right? That's pretty much it. But the point is, there's not much to do about medication. There's not much to do about education. There's not much to do about incarceration. Because you had $33 billion, and now you've got, like, 25. Right. It's not a lot. It sounds like a lot, 25 billion. And the thing is, it's growing, right? Yeah. And it's even when it comes to the three components that the state provides, the educate, um, incarcerate, and, and Medicaid, it's even less than that. There's about 16 billion that we have to allocate across um, those functions. Of 16 government. rather than 26 because what? Because there's other things that we have to pay that go beyond the pension too. Okay. Which are, for example, we have um, other bond commitments that we have to pay off. We have our transfers out, which is monies that go to our local units okay. of government and the rest. So there's, it really comes down. And then we still have a $6 billion um, backlog? backlog in bills. Oh, unpaid bills. Yeah. Okay, the state's kind of a deadbeat. Yep. So, you know, Bill Brady was here, and, and he said over the next 30 years, with reform, we're going to spend about $200 billion on money going into pension funds, about $6 billion a year. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, do we have that? Can we do it? And he said, well, yeah, we have to. Is he right? Even with pension reform, is it your estimate the state's going to spend roughly $6 billion a year on pensions? We for state employees, uh, it's going to come close to that, correct? Even so we're going to be living with in. this even with reform. So all the efforts you're doing is not to make it easier. You're going to be living with that for the rest of I don't know, a generation or two, right? Right. Is this any way to run a railroad? You know, it's it's given you know where the state position is right now that this is a obligation you know we're looking at trying to get us to the point where we know what that pension payment is we want to fix the problem over 30 years and every year is not a new surprise so that's we we know what we need to do to to fix it and the goal right now is to get it so what do we need to do darlene singer well, what, I should say, you know, this is not just a random state rep. She's part of what I call the G9 because she's the governor and the four tops, the four, t four leaders, mm -hmm. the majority and minority leaders, Cullerton and Madigan, Speaker Madigan, President Cullerton, Senate and House leaders, majority leaders, and then the minority leaders, the Republican mm -hmm. leaders, Cross and Redonio. Mm -hmm. There are the four tops meeting with the governor, and then we've got Senator Mike Noland and Senator Bill Brady, Republican and Democrat, and then we have State Representative Elaine Neckritz and State oh. Representative Darlene Singer, Democrat and Republican. Right. You folks are the G9. Right, the total. You're the working group the governor has appointed to work with the leaders and him to fix this problem. Right. You started doing that, what, in February? You know, the governor's work group started in February, but actually... February um, of 2012. Of 2012. However, on the um, House side, the House has been working on this problem. This is our third year. We had a, a bill last year, okay. Senate Bill 512, that we worked on, and then we had special work groups over the Was that the sort summer. of a Republican bill? Uh, the sponsor by the Republicans, that was wasn't it? No, Madigan was the... He was the sponsor, he was the sponsor on, it? on it. So right. Senate Bill 512 had Madigan support and mm -hmm. Republican support. Right. 
Right. I was going to say, would you say Democratic support or just Madigan support? Uh, it, well, it's hard to say. Well, it, was that the precursor of the stuff you're doing now? That, that laid a lot of the groundwork. Okay. So then Quinn comes out and says, okay, he's waiting for your report, but he said in April before he got anything from you folks, he said three things he wants. He wants COLA reform, cost of living index, retirement age to go up, and he wants and he wants employee contributions to go up, and I, we talked about this before. Even though it wasn't legislation, we know what Quinn was suggesting. You knew what he was suggesting. Yeah. If the legislature had done that, all five funds, done the kinds of things he talked about in those three areas, he said in a press conference when I asked him that would have cured over time sixty to seventy billion dollars of the underfunding. Did he get that right? Well, a lot was changed between those points and that analysis and where the bill is today. And we did see, well, here's... here's we'll the, answer that question. At that time, at, at that, well, even though it wasn't specific legislation, you knew what he was talking about, yeah. I knew. Was he right? Was he being honest? If we had done that, would we have done $70 billion of cures of the... We weren't really sure. And What's the your, reason well, looking why, back, what do you think, though? Uh, well, What's your best guess? My best guess is probably we have a piece in there called the election, whether you take the deal or not. Okay. And, you know, that... Your best 70, guess. Your best guess. I people, think it was going to probably be more like 40, depending on who and did who okay. took the deal or not. You'd have to get a lot more people to take the deal yeah. to get up to 70, is your right. view. Right. And he, in fairness to the governor, he when looked at it, he may have been estimating more to take the deal, and he may have been right. Right. But if they did do that, 70 billion, if not 40 to yeah. 50 billion. And tell people about that, that election. Why would you put an election in there, and what was it? Uh, basically, the consideration, the election piece, had to do with if you took the deal, you would, you would be subsidized by some extent on your health insurance. If you did not take the deal, then you weren't going to have health insurance. That's how the consideration part was yeah. had. And the, and, and the deal, and the deal would be to reduce the COLA, you would voluntarily say, my cost of living adjustment as a retiree will be less. Right. And if you do that, you get to keep your health care. Right. If you don't, you lose your right. retiree health care. Right. Okay. And did anybody negotiate, or was it also a part of the deal in terms of the retirement age going up, in terms of the employee contribution going up? Because individuals don't get to say on that, right? So how does that come in? Was it just the unions accepting it, or what does that mean? Well, uh, basically, for those those two pieces that were there before, the original deal with healthcare or not had the retirement age of 67, and also had a now the employee who a teacher pays 9.6 percent would pay 12 percent. Okay. So those that was the deal to begin with that the, Quinn thought he would save 60 to 70 billion. Those the age uh, uh, 67 age piece went away. And the uh, employee and contribution Why did they go away? Out. Did people think that it would be less likely to be constitutional? Because the Illinois Constitution says you can't. Basically, retirees, Illinois employees, have a contractual relationship, uh, is the argument, with that they're, the state is obligated contractually. It's enforceable to pay these, these pensions that have accrued. There's a question as to what's accrued and when. But so the whole idea is they're grappling. You're grappling right. with that. You want to have reform, but you want it to be constitutional. And you thought this thing about the choice makes it a negotiation and therefore right. constitutional. And also about the employee contribution being changed in the retirement age. Can you do that, or did people shoot? Did people get skittish about that, thinking it might be less constitutional? You know, I don't think it was a function of constitutional, but I think it had more to do with um, pushback by particularly on the teacher side to work till age 67. Oh, the teachers unions. Yeah. The other change that was made that wasn't in the governor's original um, proposal, retirees were not touched, but at the end they were. So the retiree COLA was also um, calculated at the, in the final bill, which okay. wasn't there before. So it got, it got very complicated very quickly at the end. Things got changed very quickly. So that, does that explain where we are politically? Because people, wise people like Senator Matt Murphy on Chicago Tonight said when Carol Marine asked him if there would be legislation before November 6th, the election, he said, smiled and said there will be 
uh, there'll be a reform legislation passed before the end of the calendar year, meaning after November 6, you would have a lot of lame ducks who would vote for it, but nobody wants to do that vote before. Or is it true? Is it just the Democrats who don't want to do the vote because they'd lose a lot, unions would be upset, they may have the unions up protest, lose employee, union contributions. So is it the Democrats don't want to do it and that's why it won't pass? Or do you think Republicans also may not want to do it because they may have political issues if they vote for reform legislation? You know, I don't, I can't be specific to say, you know, who's, who's keeping it from happening and the rest. I do know um, what the deal breaker was for the Republicans. This round, though, has to do with shifting cost to the local school districts. So there's what has happened with the bill, and this is what's making it very complicated, which I'm starting to be. I'm listening to Quinn talk at the last meeting. I'm really starting to wonder. You know, he's saying he wants this done quickly, but he knows what the deal breakers are. So he's not really doing the, the job of putting votes on himself. So. What Murphy is saying could partially be true because adding the normal cost piece was a deal breaker for the Republicans. Our vote. The, the cost shift. The cost shift. And explain to people what the cost shift is. What the, what the cost shift is is that basically if you're a, an employer, and they're saying now school districts and universities would be an employer, you're responsible for the employer contribution. And the cost shift would say it currently the employer, the school district, pays the salaries of the teachers and administrators, but the pensions are, if you're upstate, suburban, mm -hmm. and if you're downstate, outside the Chicago public schools, right. you, that local school district, which pays the other education costs and taxes the right. local people, mainly through property taxes, to pay for it, they don't pay the pensions that's picked up by the general taxpayers. Of course, people pay, but they're paying as a general taxpayer through their income tax, right. as opposed to disproportionately paying more through their property tax. Right. And that's the cost shift to say, Mike Madigan says, that's silly. People, school districts deciding, at least in terms something about pensions, if they give people increased salaries, they're increasing their pensions and they should calculate that into their costs when they decide when they want to give people increased salaries. They don't, so Speaker Mike Madigan, who's all of a sudden gotten a yen for efficiency, it turns out he's a Chicago economist all along. <laughs> he didn't know that. Milton Friedman, right here. We'll talk about Milton Friedman. Capitalism and Freedom, University of Chicago, Brief Digression. Have you read this book? Yeah. You have read this yeah. book? Mm -hmm. We're gonna give you a copy anyway, so you can <laughs> hand it to somebody Good. who hasn't read it. And, but and but I just want to note that, which well, is 2012, wanted, I just want to say, this something about this book, Milton Friedman, most prominent, I think, and most influential economist of the 20th century, wrote this in 1962. 2012, we're in the 50th anniversary. Nobody seems to have noticed mm -hmm. that except public affairs. And the Heartland Institute, copies of Capitalism and Freedom by Milton Friedman. I give this out to guests, but really, it's the Heartland Institute that underwrites yeah. that, and they are promoting it. But you know, we're fair. If there's something comparable, the other side, to capitalism and freedom, and you know a foundation, and they want to give us books to balance, I don't know mm -hmm. what it would be. Some people used to say it was the Affluent Society by John Galbraith. Give me a set of books. We'll hand it out. We'll hand it to our yeah, conservative good. friends. Anyway, but. But going back. But so Mike Madigan sort of is a believer. Milton Friedman would almost say yeah. this. And I'll get you to sex, but this, the interesting point is, the Illinois Policy Institute, people may know about them, is sort of a free market, liberty-oriented think tank. They, I think, are officially or unofficially in favor of this cost shift, and Speaker Mike Madigan is favoring this cost shift. So does politics make strange bedfellows between, strange bedfellows between John Tillman and Speaker Mike Madigan? Uh, it's, it's been interesting to watch, watch the whole thing. The, the but it is true. The Illinois Policy Institute does seem in favor of yeah, the cost shift. Yeah, they're in favor of the cost shift. Speaker Mike Madigan, he's in favor of the cost shift. He's in favor of the cost shift. And Republicans are supposed to be free market, liberty-oriented, free market. They're not so much. The cost shift. You're not in favor of the cost shift, right? I'm not in favor of the cost shift. <coughs> remember, You're a remember what this is, is that if the markets go down, and lose, if you're in a 401k and, you're, and the market goes down, you lose value in your retirement plan. If the markets go down and you're a school district, you're now responsible <coughs> for making up that difference. 
So that's the piece that we have to really think through thoroughly to make sure. Is that the concern, really, that the, the volatility of the markets and the school district's going to be affected by the volatility in a way they can't plan? They will be responsible for all the, any unfunded liability that's being caused, whether it's on the state side, whether <coughs> it's caused but by the But they're themselves. responsible now in the form of paying higher state income taxes, because that's where this money comes from, higher state sales taxes. People are responsible now. They're on the hook now, right. They're, they're but paying. this would make them, your point is, disproportionately more so. It would make the school district more dependent on that. <coughs> they may have to go for an increase in property taxes through a referendum. That's your argument. That's the argument right now. <coughs> given, Excuse me. yeah, given the given the tax caps that are out there, you know, there's really no mechanism through except through a referendum. To but go Mike out. Madigan and, the, and Governor Quinn said we've looked at this. We find people; these districts have a lot of reserves. If they're going to have to pay a little bit more, either to the due to the volatility of stock market returns or otherwise, they can afford it. What do you say? I don't see where the reserves are. <laughs> really? I mean, haven't they documented it for you? They look. I, I mean, I haven't seen the specific, but I haven't seen where the school districts are loaded in okay. reserves. Right but if now. they if they showed you that, and if you became persuaded of that, then would you say, okay, do the economic, do the pension reform legislation, have the cost shift, you'll make a deal? Pension. The pension problem is not the cost shift. It doesn't. The cost shift doesn't do anything doesn't to cause, solve the problem. It's just the redistributing between who pays right. for these pension costs. And it shouldn't be okay. an excuse not to solve the problem. So you're, you're, you're with those people who say, Speaker Mike Madigan, put this in here as a poison pill simply to prevent e pension reform legislation from going forward because he wants to stay Speaker. He wants Democrats to stay in the majority so he can stay Speaker. He's afraid if the unions get upset because they're upset by that reform legislation, they won't contribute to the Democrats. Democrats can't stay speak stay members in the majority. They won't st continue to be reelected. Speaker Mike Madigan loses speakership. He's been there for what 28 or 30 years, yeah. something like that. Right. And, and that's why the speaker's doing this. You're of that view. I, well, I you know again I I'm not inside the head of the speaker, but if you looked at the dynamic dynamics that went yeah. on the last few days, it's pretty obvious that throwing that that shift in there okay. was the poison pill. <clears throat> All right, so as you as we tape this, we're going to continue to speak as the credits roll. I very much want to take, thank uh, Darlene Singer, State Representative Darlene Singer, Republican from Naperville for coming out and explaining all this. But <clears throat> at the end of the day, July 7th, are you saying there's no way really we're going to have pension reform legislation because of the stalemate that we just talked about, cost shift here? Uh, two things have Speaker to, Mike Madigan's yeah. interests and the Republicans. Some would say the Republicans don't want it because they are disproportionately upstate and downstate, not in Chicago. They're going to be hurt politically. They politically don't want this. You might have other reasons, but politically you don't want it. The Speaker doesn't want it politically. Therefore, nothing happens before November 6th. It's, you yeah. Agree with that? It's, I, I mean, I. Would you agree? I would probably place my bets on it's. Nothing happens. More, yeah. It's more likely November. All right. So there you go. We're making news right here. You can all go home. You can put on the Cubs, put on the White Sox. Don't have to watch Berkowitz do public affairs with Darlene Singer anymore because nothing's happening before November 6th, right? Right and then now, we'll bring in the lame ducks. Right we'll bring in the lame ducks. They'll march in, and then after that, just like the lame ducks gave you a five billion dollar tax increase, they're going to give you some kind of pension reform. The lame ducks rule. We could send everybody home, Darlene. Without disres no disrespect, but send all you folks home. The only folks we need are a bunch of lame ducks to vote for things after the election.
shore up some of the abuses that are out there, particularly the, uh, I mean, we have to get more strict with the end of career bump ups, which this bill, even if you shift the cost, doesn't mean that that goes away, because that hasn't been addressed yet. So there's a, there's a lot, lot to be done in order to get us to the point where we're. Well, what would the bill, what in your view, what, if it does pass, what will it look like? There'll be a modification of the COLA, right? Right. Will there be an employee contribution increase? 